Welcome to our Bible study, all images are reasonable use, non-profit. Here's a sneak peek at today's living power. God saved us. God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. God knew you before earth was even created. It's all about Jesus. Live for God Studio Productions. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Here's today's Living Power scripture reading. Good morning. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love, toward me. Can we have an album? Amen. Amen. Isn't, it, isn't it amazing how much God loves us? Yes. Amen. How much he cares about us. And it seems in so many times in life that he just has abandoned us. And that he's, he's not there. And I can tell you, when God is silent, that's when he is his loudest. When God is quiet, that's when he is up to something. And we're going to see that in our study of of, of numbers, how God is at work even when we wonder where he is. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would give us truth this morning, an understanding of your word, and how we can take it and apply it in our lives and make it work. Oh God, you love us so much. You have such a desire for each of us individually. You created each of us uniquely in a way that brings pleasure to you. And Father, you have a purpose and a plan for each of us. So Father, instill that, anoint that, that truth in our lives this morning. Give us understanding on how we should face difficult times when we're in the desert of life and how we should stand and keep on keeping on in the middle of it all. I pray this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. 
The book of Numbers is the fourth book of the Pentateuch. There are five books that are considered the Pentateuch or the Torah, uh, or Torah. We refer to it as the Torah. Uh, Hebrew doesn't have the word the, so they just refer to it as Torah. Uh, so I kind of waffle back and forth between the two. Um, it is traditionally, Numbers is traditionally ascribed uh, to Moses as something that Moses wrote, but that doesn't mean that he wrote it all. In fact, Numbers doesn't even say that Moses wrote it. Uh, the name of the book is based on a census list. There's a census in the first four chapters of number, Numbers, and then there's a census in the 26th chapter. And these, this census was, uh, it's, it's, it was to, to start the, while they were, they're in the desert now, they've left Egypt, and they've been in the desert now for two years. And now it's time for them to move on and to start toward this promised land. And they're going to have to face some battles, and they're going to have to prepare for that. And so this, this census is considered a war census, uh, to find out who is capable of, of becoming a warrior uh, while they, and protect them while they're in the desert. So this book is set in uh, over a period of 38 years. First two years we just studied um, and in Exodus. And now Numbers covers 38 years from the time where we just left off to uh, the time that they reach the border of the Promised Land. Um, the book is, uh, you know, another way of thinking of the book of Numbers is the memoirs of Moses in the desert years. And if you can understand that, when you study Numbers, then you begin to see it in a different light. Numbers isn't so much a book of chronological history, but rather it's a narration of specific events. So it's basically just telling the story of things that happened while they were in the desert. So don't look at it as a, as a historical narrative of then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. But look at it as individual events that happened, and as they happened, what can we learn from those things? Now, interestingly, when you step back from the book of Numbers, what you see is that it's a book of worship. It is a book about worship. Um, it spends a great deal of attention on the worship patterns of, of Israel. It's not just that the book of Numbers contains worship, and there's some wonderful passages of worship. I can't wait to get into these. Uh, for example, the Aaronic Benediction, which is in number six, and then uh, the instructions for Passover, which is in, in numbers nine. Um, and so there's some amazing passages there uh, that are so deep and so rich. But overall, it describes the worship of God by Moses and his people. And in principle, it teaches us what God expects from our worship. Now, the book of Numbers uh, before the book of Numbers can become a book of worship, it becomes a, a book of trouble and conflict. In other words, as we get into Numbers, we're going to be seeing a lot of trouble and a lot of conflict. Uh, and so while we're seeing this, this, these issues of conflict that happen in the people's lives, particularly between man and God, uh, on the other hand, we're going to see the resolution to that conflict, which ends up in worship. So every time we see conflict in Numbers, what we see it res resolving is as worship. So every conflict leads to worship. Now, who is the book of Numbers for? Well, obviously all believers. But I want you to think about this. At the time the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, at the time that he was writing in the New Testament, the time that John was writing, at the, at the time that all of these, these apostles were writing, uh, and they were writing letters to the churches and letters to the believers, at the time of their writing, the New Testament wasn't complete. All it was was just, I mean, these letters were being passed around, but there was no New Testament. And for those of you who are just, just you, you think that everything hinges on King James, you have good reason, that was the Bible that they carried, you know, in, in, in the New Testament. It wasn't. It was supposed to be a joke and it fell flat. Everybody knows they, they carried the New, new International Version. Um, anyways, but they, so they didn't have a New Testament. And so when the Apostle, when the Apostle Paul is speaking to Timothy, look at, look at something that he says. 
Uh, in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, but as for you, speaking to Timothy, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from who you learned it, which would have been his mother, his mother and, and grandmother, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scriptures breathe out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness. But key in on what, what verse 15 says. You have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. What were those secret writings? What were those, I'm not secret, those sacred writings? Well, the sacred writings that, that Paul is talking about and that Timothy studied uh, were not the writings of Paul or the other apostles. Timothy was a student of Moses and Isaiah and David, and particularly Moses. He was a student of Moses and, and Isaiah and David. You see, in classical Jewish education, um, it, it, what they did was they would study, first they would study Torah, they would study the Torah, and then they would study the prophets, and then they would study what were called the writings, which were Psalms and Proverbs and that sort of thing. So Timothy studied Torah. Timothy studied the Pentateuch. Timothy studied Numbers. Those were the sacred writings that the Apostle Paul is talking about. That's all they had. So Paul is referring to these sacred writings, and what he's telling Timothy is that the Old Testament truths and principles are the foundation for living a victorious life. And through those teachings, one can become acquainted with Jesus, the Messiah. And through the foundation that's given to us in Torah, we find this foundation for living a victorious life. And those books attributed to Moses, including Numbers, are the foundations for biblical faith. The book of Numbers is an essential part of the Word of God. And we dare not ignore its teaching. What does it contain? Now, I will tell you, if you have trouble falling asleep at night, read the first four chapters of Numbers. Uh, but it, it, there are some really boring parts in there. But it is, it is inspired. There is a reason for it. God gives it to say something. In the book of Numbers, we read, in the entire book of Numbers, we read about the murmuring and the rebellion and of the people against God and, and their subsequent judgment. The very people whom God redeemed from slavery in Egypt, those people, uh, those people who, to whom God displayed his, his grace at Mount Sinai, those people responded with indifference and ingratitude and repeated acts of rebellion. Sounds like some Christians today, doesn't it? And these redeemed people were punished by God and they were punished by being forbidden to enter the promised land. They were made to live out their lives in the desert of Sinai. Only their children would enjoy the promise that was originally to be theirs. In fact, no adults that left Egypt uh, made it to the promised land. Joshua was about 10 years old when they left uh, Egypt. And he actually led the Israelites into the promised land. And so, uh, so the, the adults that left Egypt never made it. They died in the desert. And so with them died that promise that was carried on to their children. And that happened because of their rebellion against God's grace and their disbelief and their disbelief in his power to deliver them. And in fact, they were in breach of that covenant that God had established with them. Their breach comprised an entire generation. Miriam and Aaron and even Moses were not exempt from that. They didn't make it to the promised land. The fourth book of the Pentateuch presents a, a sobering, chilling reality. The God who had entered into a covenant with Abraham, who had delivered his people from bondage in the Exodus, who had revealed his holiness and a way to find grace through worship, 
This same Yahweh was also a God of wrath. He was a consuming fire, the Bible says. And we need to see that God's wrath extends to errant children as well as to his enemies. God doesn't just get angry with his enemies. He gets angry with his children when they rebel. Now, I want you to get this. God, God's wrath is his wrath. He owns it. God's wrath is a mark of his sovereignty. And yet it opens to his grace. His wrath, tempered by his love, leads to his grace. We need to understand that. God doesn't get mad and stay mad. His anger leads us to his grace. That's so important to understand. To think that Moses came under God's wrath is stunning to me. I, I look at that and I think, wow, if that could happen to Moses, it could happen to any of us. Chapter 20, by the way, of Numbers, which records the final error uh, of Moses. It begins, that chapter begins with the notice of the death of Miriam, and the chapter concludes with the notice of the death of Aaron. And what we see in chapter 20 is this passing, if you will, of the noble leadership of the Israelites, the, the noble guard, the old guard, as it were. That's what happens in chapter 20. Those whom God had used to establish the nation would die before the nation came into its own. And so uh, it, was, it was one of those things where God took them and he gave them the opportunity and they squandered it. And they rebelled against God. And in their rebellion, there was a price to pay for that. The book of Numbers presents the story of the rebellion of the people of Israel in the desert of Sinai. So that's what we're going to be studying. The generation that was delivered from slavery failed to respond to the Lord with faith and in gratitude. And in doing so, they forfeited their part in the land of promise. Only their children would experience the blessing of God's promise. Now be very careful that you don't read into this something that's not there. Did not say, and it is not implying, that you can lose God's grace. It's not saying that. It's not saying that you, if you rebel against God, you don't make it to heaven. It's not saying that. It's saying there's a process that God wants to take us through here on earth, things that he wants to do in and through our lives here on earth. And if we rebel against them, we lose, we lose the privilege of his promise. We lose the blessing of his fellowship. So the book that describes these desert years is designed to encourage spiritual confidence on the part of people who are about to leave the desert. You see, these writings didn't come into play until they were pretty much halfway through the desert. It was the children that got the writings, these sacred writings of Moses. It was those children that reflected on the writings when Moses wrote or dictated these writings, and they said, oh yeah, that is what happened. And now we see how that applies. Let me tell you something, your losses, your pain, your suffering, the things that you go through don't have to be the end of your story. The difficulties that you go through in life don't have to be the end of your story. Get this, here's a great tattoo for you. Your desert is not your destiny. Your desert is not your destiny. What you're going through, the deal, the things that you have to put up with in your life, the difficulties, the sorrow, the loss, the failure, all of those things. And if we all were honest about it, and I said, if you're having difficulties in your life, raise your hand, it'd pretty much be all of us, wouldn't it? And it would be difficult for us to, I mean, if we started telling stories, I mean, we wouldn't get through it. It would be so excruciating, the things that happen in life. But I've said it already once today, and I'll say it again. When God is quiet, that is when he's his loudest. He's up to something. And that's what the book of Numbers is all about. It's about discovering your destiny. And that your destiny is not the desert. 
It's about facing the reality of your desert, focusing on the promises of God, and then entering into his will, the promised land. That's what Numbers is all about. It's about discovering your destiny, facing the reality of your desert, focusing on the promises of God, and then entering into his will, the promised land. Now, we're not going to go through verse by verse of these first four chapters, considering we only have 13 minutes left. Uh, but I, I, I want you to know that this, these four chapters are, are, are basically the establishment of this war census, as I talked about. But there are four things that we can see in these first four chapters that give us great insight on what to do when we find ourselves in a desert. When you find yourself in a spiritual desert, when it just seems like life is dried up around you, when you find yourself in the desert, there are four things that you should do. Interestingly, these four things are exactly what we should do in these perilous times that we live. Because it seems like we're about to enter into a major world war. Could happen. Uh, it could be that battle, that, as I mentioned, that is talked about in Ezekiel 38. In any case, it certainly is a major conflagration in the Middle East. And we're involved as a country. So these are four things that apply to us today, not only in the difficult times that we're going through politically, but also in our own personal lives when there are difficult issues that we're having to face. What are these four things? Let's start with the first one. The first one is in Numbers chapter 1, and it is you are to prepare for spiritual battle. Prepare for a spiritual battle. Numbers 1, verses 1 and 2, the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting on the first day of the second month in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, take a census of all the congregation of the people of Israel by clans, by fathers' houses, according to the number of names, every male head by head. Now that was a preparation. They were preparing for what was coming in the future. And you have to be spiritually prepared for the days that you're going to face. You see, most of us prepare based on what's happened. We look at our lives and the difficulties that we're going through and the losses that we have and the failures that we have in our life, and we prepare for that instead of preparing for what God has for us in the future. Because it, it's easier to look back on it and reflect on it. It is our reality. But listen, your future is also your reality. And I want you to remember this. Our God is not the God of the past. He's the God of the future. God's not looking at your past going, wow. Because God knows. God's looking at your future and going, wow. God has plans for you. And nothing has happened in your life that has thwarted God's plans for you. He knew about you and the circumstances of your life before the foundations of the earth. The Bible tells us that. I hope we can get into that today. But that is the, the significant truth. Your God is planning your future. He's not planning your past. He's not dwelling on your past. He's preparing you for your future. What you're going through right now is preparation for tomorrow. God is preparing you. So, prepare for spiritual battle. It's so easy for us to forget the spiritual warfare that surrounds us. We focus on what we can see with our physical eyes, but we need to see that what we're going through is a spiritual issue. In fact, the only way that we can really understand what's going on in the Middle East is to understand that it's a spiritual issue. And the only way that we can actually see what's going on in our own life is that it's a spiritual issue. We need to prepare for spiritual battle. The second thing is that we need to know our place. Know your place. Numbers chapter 2, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, the people of Israel shall camp, each by his own standard, which is a flag, with the banners of their father's houses. They shall camp facing the tent of meeting on every side. He gave them specific places for them to put their camp. Every tribe had their own place. And every time they set up camp, they always set up in the same place, in the same position around the, 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 the tabernacle. And that was by design. God designed it. God had a plan, and God has a plan for you, and you need to know your place. You fit into a plan that God put in motion from the beginning of time. Look at this. 
in, uh, in uh, Matthew 25, 34, uh, Jesus said this. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. God has prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Nothing has happened in your life where God has gone, oh, boy, you didn't see that coming. God knew. God knows. He knows what's ahead. And then in 2 Timothy, God saved us. God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. God knew you before earth was even created. And he planned for you before earth was even created. Now catch that. You are part of God's plan. You, you. Man, I look at some of you and I go, really? But the answer is yes, you. You are part of God's plan. He didn't design you and gift you and prepare you for any other time of history. You are part of his plan for today, in this place, at this point in history. You're part of his plan. His plan was for you to be in the world at this point in history, today. Not a thousand years ago. And I, I'm going to ask the Lord, why didn't he let me live, you know, like a thousand years ago? It was so much simpler then. Right? No, not right. But why? Why now? Why me? Why now? And you can ask yourself the same question. But here's the answer to it. Get over it. You're here. God has a plan. He has a purpose that he planned before the foundation of the earth. You're part of his plan and you fit into his plan right now. And the things that you're going through is not that God planned that, is that God is using that to shape you into what he wants for your future. God knows how to take what's happened in your life and use it to shape you into what he wants to accomplish for your future. So, if you're part of what God is up to today, that means that there is something that God wants to accomplish in and through your life today. If God is, it is, if God is up to your, it is up to something in your life today, then there is something that he wants to accomplish in your life today. And it's, listen to this, it's not about you. It's not even for you. It's what God wants to do through you. That's really important. And that brings us to this third point, which means you have a ministry to accomplish. Do your ministry. Chapter 3, Numbers 3. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near and set them before Aaron the priest, that they may minister to him. There were people who had this calling to minister to Aaron. That was, that was their ministry. Every one of us, you, have a ministry. You have a calling from God. He has designed you in a way that he wants to use to accomplish something in and through your life. Think about that. God's up to two things in your life. Something that he wants to accomplish in your life and something that he wants to accomplish through your life. Do your ministry. What is it that God's up to in your life? In other words, let God do what he wants to do in and through you. And you don't get to choose your ministry. You don't get to choose that. God has already planned that out. Your responsibility is to be willing, to be ready, and to be focused on him and what he's up to in your life. Which brings us to the fourth point. Get to work. Get busy. Numbers chapter 4, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Take a census of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi by their clans and their fathers' houses. From 30 years old up to 50 years old, all who can come on duty to do the work in the tent of meeting. What God was saying was, get to work. 
People know what they're supposed to do now? Get to work. So get to work. It's a step-by-step -step process. And it starts with you doing what you know God wants you to do. I mean, some of you are sitting there, well, I don't know what God wants me to do. Oh, you know some things. You may not want to do them, but you do know some things that God wants you to do. You see, that's called faith. Faith isn't guessing what God wants you to do. Faith is knowing what you know God wants you to do. Faith is doing what you know God wants you to do. And that is clearly marked out in his word through his promises. The word of God tells you God, the promises of God, and there are over 6,000 promises in the Bible that apply to you. And every promise is a way of God saying, I promise that if you will do this, or I promise I'm going to do every time. Every promise is the revelation of the will of God. It's God saying, this is my will. This is what I want to happen. And this is what I want to happen for you. And if you will obey me and you, if you will follow me and if you will do things my way, then this is going to happen in your life. What better instruction is that? There's nothing better than the word of God to tell you what it is that God wants you to do. So don't listen to all the gurus and all of the, even, even if they're religious gurus, you shouldn't even be listening to me. You should be listening to the word of God. What does the word of God say that he wants you to do? Get into the promises of God. The promises of God are the revelation of his will. Let him reveal his will to you through his word. And get to work. Let's pray. Father, you, you amaze me that you have a purpose and a plan for each of us. That you designed for each of us before the foundation of the earth. God, you are up to something in each of our lives. And we don't always understand it. A lot of times we don't like it. But Father, you see the big picture. You're looking to our future. So, Father, teach us and help us to not dwell on the past, but to focus on the future, on what you want to happen in our lives, on what you want to accomplish in and through us. And may that begin in our lives today, even right now. Give us this burning desire to be what you want us to be. Anoint this word, O oh God, in a way that builds a fire in our lives to become what you have designed and destined us to be. And we trust you for that. Give us insight. Give us clarity. And Father, I pray that you would stimulate our faith to be all that you have desired for us. I pray in the holy name of Jesus. Next Sunday, we're going to take a look at the issue of confession. What's confession all about? We all say, well, confess means if you say that what you did wrong is wrong. What? Really? Why? I mean, why, why are you telling God? God knows. So what is confession really all about? How does it really, really work? So we'll get into that next Sunday. In the meantime, go away. Scripture quotations are from the ESV Registered Bible, the Holy Bible, English Standard Version, copyright 2001 by Crossway a publishing ministry of good news publishers used by permission all rights reserved the esv text may not be quoted in any publication made available to the public by a creative commons license the esv may not be translated in whole or in part into any other language scriptures taken from the holy bible new international version niv registered copyright 1973 1978 1984 2011 by biblica incorporated used by permission of zondervan all rights reserved worldwide. www.zondervan.com The NIV and New International Version are trademarks registered in the United States Patent and Trademark Office by Biblica Incorporated.